Good afternoon. I'm just going to wait one second to let the stream start, the live stream. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to the Office of Tax Appeals. My name is Andrew Wong. I'm the lead administrative law judge or ALJ who will be conducting the oral hearing for this case. On today's panel, in addition to myself, we have judges Michael Geary and Daniel Cho. Also present is our stenographer, Ms. Lynn Alonzo. <clears throat> this hearing is being conducted electronically. All participants, including the ALJs, are video conferencing into the hearing. Should you have any problems with video conferencing during the hearing, please rejoin as soon as possible. This video conference is being live streamed to the public and a video recording will be made available on OTA's YouTube channel. Our stenographer, Ms. Alonzo, will report this hearing verbatim and prepare an official hearing transcript, which will be made available on OTA's website. <clears throat> to help Ms. Alonzo make a clear record, I have four requests. Number one, please state your name every time before you speak. Number two, please speak slowly, clearly, and directly into your microphone or communication device. <clears throat> number three, please do not speak over each other or interrupt when someone else is speaking. And number four, please answer verbally. Uh, please don't nod or grunt or anything like that or shake your head. If Ms. Alonzo cannot hear, understand, or identify someone who is speaking, she has permission to interrupt the oral hearing at any time to get clarification. I would like to clarify that this oral hearing is before the Office of Tax Appeals, also known as OTA, which is a separate agency from the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, CDTFA. OTA is not a court, but is an independent appeals body. The office is staffed by tax experts and is independent of the state's tax agencies. Uh, as I noted earlier, I'm the lead ALJ for purposes of conducting this oral hearing. However, uh, my However, my co-panelists and I are co-equal decision makers and may ask questions of either party during the hearing. Further, our panel of three ALJs will decide all the issues presented to us and each of us will have an equal vote in making those decisions. Now, let's introduce the parties. Who is here for the appellant? Ronson Shimon on behalf of the appellant Pine Valley LLC and the, who's and the witness for the appellant would be Alfred Atala. Thank you, Mr. Shamoon. Uh, well, uh, I see there are other people in the room with you. Will they also be speaking today? No, Your Honor. They're just here to observe. Okay. Thank you. Uh, who's here for CDTFA? Randy Swazo, hearing representative. Jason Parker, Chief of Headquarters Operations Bureau. Christopher Brooks, Tax Counsel for CDTFA. Thank you. We have one issue today, and that is whether adjustments are warranted to the audited understatement of reported gasoline sales. Is that correct, uh, Mr. Shamoon? I'm sorry, Your Honor. I didn't know you were sorry. I'm sorry. Say that again. Uh, we have one issue today. I was just uh, recapping the issue we have today, whether adjustments are warranted to the audited understatement of reported gasoline sales. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. CDTFA, is that a correct statement of the issue? This is Randy Swazo. That's correct. Okay. Uh, now let's verify the exhibits. Appellant has proposed exhibits one through two. CDTFA, did you have any objections to those exhibits? This is Randy Swazo. No objections. Okay. And Mr. Shimon, you had no other documents or exhibits to submit. Is that correct? I know, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. And the CT, CDTFA proposed exhibits A through I. Mr. Shamoon, did you have any objections to those proposed exhibits? No, Your Honor. Thank you. And CDTFA, you have no other documents or exhibits to add. Is that correct? That is correct. This is Randy Swazo. That is correct. Okay. Uh, and appellant, Mr. Shamoon, you have one witness, Mr. Alfred Atala. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, at the appropriate time, I will swear him in. And CDTFA has no witnesses, correct? This is Randy's puzzle. That is correct. Okay. Uh, it's anticipated that the oral hearing will take approximately 100 minutes. Appellant has requested 60 minutes in total, uh, divided between uh, opening presentation and witness testi testimony, 45 minutes, and then a closing and rebu a rebuttal and closing, 15 minutes. And CDTFA has requested 20 minutes 
and then 20 minutes for judges' questions and preliminary matters introdu and introductions like this one. Okay. So any final questions before we go on the record? Uh, Mr. Shamoon, any final questions? I know, Your Honor. Okay. And CDTFA, any final questions before going on the record? This is Randy Suazo. No questions. Okay. Uh, Ms. Alonzo, are you ready to go on the I'm sorry, can you hold on for just a second? Sure, I got my wires crossed. I'm ready to go. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. All right. We are opening the record in the appeal of Pine Valley LLC before the Office of Tax Appeals. This is OTA case number 18124143. Today is Wednesday, June 29th, 2022, and the time is 1.07 p.m. We are holding this hearing by video conference. I am Lead Administrative Law Judge Andrew Wong, and with me today are Judges Michael Geary and Daniel Cho. We are the panel hearing and deciding this case. Individuals representing appellant, please identify yourselves. Bronson Shamoon, RJS Law, on behalf of appellant of Pine Valley LLC. Thank you. Individuals representing the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, please identify yourselves. Randy Suazo, hearing representative, CDTFA. Jason Parker, Chief of Headquarters Operations Bureau with CDTFA. Christopher Brooks, Tax Counsel for CDTFA. Thank you. We are considering one issue today, and that is whether adjustments are warranted to the audited understatement of reported gasoline sales. Appellant has identified and submitted proposed exhibits one through two as evidence. Appellant uh, has no other exhibits to offer as evidence, and CDTFA had no objections to them. Is that correct, CDTFA? This is Randy Suazo. That is correct. Okay. Therefore, appellants exhibits one through two will be admitted into the record as evidence. CDTFA has identified and submitted proposed exhibits A through I as evidence and had no other exhibits to offer. And appellant has no objections to them. Is that correct, Mr. Shamoon? No objection, Your Honor. Thank you. CDTFA's exhibits A through I will be admitted into the record as evidence. Uh, appellant has one witness, Mr. Alfred Atala. Uh, before um, Mr. Shabun, you be begin your presentation, let me swear in Mr. Atala. Uh, please raise your right hand. You swear and affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. All right. And CDTFA has no witnesses. Uh, Mr. Shamoon, uh, please proceed with your presentation and witness testimony. You have 45 minutes. Well, thank you very much, Your Honor. Um, I appreciate your time uh, today. Uh, this case originated back in almost a decade ago, in 2013. In 2013, I received a phone call from a law school classmate of mine, Alfred Atala. And um, so we actually know each other through law school and uh, gave me a call and said uh, that his business uh, was being audited by um, the State Board of Equalization at the time. Um, so I, being a tax attorney and a tax law firm, told them I would assist them in the audit. Um, so the audit periods are for 2007, 2008, and 2009. The case went all the way up before the Board of Equalization and then the change happened, which kind of delayed us with the transition from CDTFA uh, to OTA, but it was right before the, the board prior to it transitioning. We attended the audit and as the exhibits that were provided by the government A through F are pretty much all the documents that are required and sought after for a sales tax audit. During that audit, the auditor wanted all nine of these exhibits. A, all the sales, yet, sales and use tax returns for the period, all the monthly profit and loss statements, all of the tax returns, all of the Z tapes, the daily Z journals. Every document that was required 
for the audit was provided for to the auditor. And they are all attached as exhibits. We did attach as additional exhibits, exhibits one and two, which one provides a, a subsequent sample of the business to show that it has the same markup, same sales, and same uh, similar pattern from the period before. Throughout that audit, we answered every one of their questions, provided documents, but it boiled down to one simple question. How much were you charging gas every single day? The documents that were provided to the auditors provided their Z tapes daily totals. We could not provide the actual daily price that was not charged on a daily basis because our cash register system would not provide that. Based on that question and that question alone, although all documents provided, receipts, daily journals, bank deposit balanced out, no additional deposits, a complete and accurate set of records were provided. Z tapes, matching bank statements, but we cannot say with certainty what we charge every single day for gas. Ultimately, the auditor made an assessment, used OPUS as a threshold, and said, because your markup doesn't seem that high, we are going to assess the OPUS price as to what you were charging your gas prices during this three year period, and we are going to send you a bill for that difference. And that is the very, very simple issue that we have before us, is whether or not we as the taxpayer provided all that we are required to provide, and did provide in an accurate set of records in order for the CDTFA or the, or the state to make a determination that there are underreported uh, sales. These methodologies are used when adequate records are not provided. In this case, as attached by the exhibits from the uh, respondent, those are the exact records that we are relying upon at our hearing. Simply that we have our books and records. And what Mr. Atala is going to testify now subsequent is how they do their business, how they keep their records, and how they run their operation. All sales have been reported in this matter. And there should not be an adjustment based on opus, based on pure speculation. There's nothing that shows records that were not provided as to why we cannot rely upon our accurate set of books that those were our sales and tax was paid accurately on those individuals. So we will show you and hope that the testimony of Mr. Atala, in addition to the documents that we will provide and go over one by one, we'll show you that all books and records are accurate and that no additional sales tax should be assessed based on OPUS numbers because it underlyingly is required that we would have to provide the daily charge rate for gas which is not a requirement of any business to keep a journal of. And if the state of California wants that requirement, then they should advertise that requirement to the public so that if they get audited and provide everything completely accurately, that they're not stuck getting a bill that could be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. In this case, still a substantial amount of money, and we've appealed it 
and I've taken this case with a pro bono because it is truly unjust to charge this individual a tax when they are providing all their records, because what more can someone do but provide adequate records? Um, I'd like to call my first witness, Your Honor. This is Judge Wong, certainly, go ahead. Okay. So, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Mr. Atala, were you sworn? Did you swear him in? I didn't, I didn't mean it. Was I was all sworn in. This is Judge Wong, yes, I swore him in prior to your presentation. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Tall. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Okay. Um, so what is your relationship to Vine Valley? I'm a family member of the trust that owns the ownership entity, Pine Valley LLC. Uh, I handle all the financial and operational aspects of the business. And uh, do you have a full-time job? I'm also an attorney and, uh, you know, work with our family and other various interests, but I, I do both. Uh, when did you become a lawyer? I think, uh, I believe 2003, November of 2003, I was sworn in. And um, so during the time that the, the audit took place for tax period seven, eight, nine, uh, you were operating a law practice while supervising the operations of the gas station. Yes, and I do that until today. Okay. What makes you well suited to speak to about the daily operations and the finance or the management of the, of the company? Well, we, uh, our family acquired the business in 1995 when I was still in high school. I started working from day one in all aspects of the business. Uh, so I think that makes it about 27 years. I also hold a bachelor's degree in business administration, a Juris Doctor, and very familiar with all the accounting practices and operational aspects of our business. And how many employees did the business have during the audit period? Yeah, our employees vary, you know, from year to year, depending on demand, but we typically had between six to eight employees for the store. And are those the six or eight employees that have been there for many years prior to the audit period? Most of them, yes. Uh, we have some turnover, you know, during the year, but a lot of our employees, being that we're a backcountry store, stay with us for a while. But we do have some turn turnover. So you have a main core group of people that have been there for many years prior to 07 and post 07, correct? Yes. Yes, correct. And what were the employees' responsibilities day to day? All employees are trained to operate every aspect of the store. So we have a convenience store inside along with deli and pizza, as well as obviously uh, keeping the store stocked and so forth. So our main positions are cashier uh, and deli and pizza, and all the employees are trained to kind of do everything just in case you have a shortfall. But uh, mainly those are the main positions, cashier, deli and pizza, and filling uh, coolers and stocking shelves. And then you go ahead and review, and then do you review uh, their closing procedures to make sure that um, all the money gets to the bank, basically? Yes, on a daily basis, we review all uh, cash drops and uh, credit card receipts, and we do the Z tapes after the shifts and make sure that the money in the till matches uh, what we rang up that day, just to make sure everything jives. And if it doesn't, we, you know, we'll find out why or what happened. Uh, and we do that on a daily basis. And for your monthly accounting work, who does your monthly accounting for you? We've had, uh, since we acquired the business, Jody Romick from Business Control Service. Uh, he does a very thorough job monthly on gathering all of our invoices, all of our vendor receipts uh, that we keep for him. And then he gets all of our uh, daily income reports and uh, balances our bank accounts and makes sure that everything is matching. So we try to have our daily checks ourselves. And then we have our bookkeeper who does it on a monthly basis, just in case something happens, you know, we know that month. So if anything, we maybe had 30 days that have passed. Okay. And you give them the daily Z tape per day, daily Z tape and all of your, um, um expenses for the month is that correct exactly and then also you know if there's uh 
some variances in the Z tape where we have uh, one of us that gets gas, we'll write it down on there to make sure everything matches. So he gets everything, our Z tapes, our invoices, our vendor receipts, and any adjustments that took place during the day. And the daily Z tape basically provides totals for every category when you Z the register, like uh, versus it doesn't print out every single sale of that day. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So we have several departments like grocery, deli, pizza, uh, gasoline. I don't have them in front of me, but there's probably six or seven different departments. And when we do the Z tape, we can see what we did on a conglomerate basis for each one of those departments. And then during the audit period, the auditor wanted us to provide, uh, did, did the auditor want you to provide um, a daily journal of every single sale transaction? I don't believe so. They just asked us for the, the daily records. Right. But would it, but if, they, if you were to provide the daily gas price, the only way to be able to provide the, each gas transaction would be to have the capabilities of having the, 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 the every yes. detail come in on one day, correct? Yes, our systems did not allow us to show the daily gas price because we would ring up the gas sale in the register uh, of whatever the the customer uh, purchased and per each sale. And then the Z tape would add it all up and give us a global number that we would cross check with uh, yeah. how many gallons we sold that day. Okay. And you've had that same system, you know, till this day. I believe we just we just changed everything uh, this last year when we switched over from uh, from independent to Valero. But yes, we had it up until I think 2019. Um, the government felt in their uh, the state felt in their assessment as to why they wanted to charge Opus. As a, as a template for what your sales were, because your markup percentage is around 15%. Why is your markup um, at 15% and how would you counter their argument that it should be higher? Our markup, you know, changes uh, when, you know, on a weekly basis, sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes it goes on for a while if, the gas prices stay steady, but gas prices change all the time. So we can't have a fixed markup uh, just because you have competition, you have, you know, other vendors in the area that may be selling gas for a certain price and you have to keep in touch with your general market. And since we are a backcountry store, we have a very unique, you know, market set that we have to uh, adhere to with regards to travelers that are coming on the freeway and then local residents that, that live there. So our, our markup is never consistent because sometimes you'll be making, you know, more on gas. Sometimes you'll be making less on gas, depending on if there was a big spike, as I'm sure everyone is kind of seeing what's happening now. Um, sometimes there's a lull and the, the, the gas prices stay steady. Uh, for a long time, but there's there's general times. I believe during this time period, you can see gas was a lot less expensive than it is today. But our market our markup would vary on a day to day basis, week to week basis, depending on what's going on in the global economy, the gas prices, San Diego, and then Pine Valley in the back country. Okay, so it's your testimony that it's very volatile. Very volatile. It's probably one of the most volatile aspects of any part of our business because but even with but even with volatility do you have a is your markup low just uh, why is your markup low let's say you just it but just overall your markup um in 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 in, in, in the state size is 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 low you know um is there a reason why you are that competitive with your pricing is there a reason why you have a low markup although it changes over time Yes, because we have competition in the area. And if competition is selling gas for a certain price, you can't just impute any markup you want and you won't even have any sales. So if, if and we have some uh, competition uh, up the freeway that's a local casino, let's say, and they give gas away pretty cheap. So you have to compete with that casino being a small two pump station that we are. 
So I, I would I argue with the state that you, you can't just impute any kind of margin to us because we have to be competitive with the general area. Do you feel that, op that those opus prices are reflective of what your prices are? Completely not. I never even heard of opus until uh, it was brought up that that's what the state was using to impute a profit margin to us when we report everything we sell. Okay. And during our uh, the initial audit, did you review the sales and use tax returns with the related summary sheet? Yes. And you believe them to be accurate? Completely accurate. Okay. And so to uh, for for the government's uh, exhibit one, the sales and use tax return, um, that's what I am talking about, and 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 Alfred confirms its validity. Uh, the general uh, you provided a general journal, which provides every single line item for daily sales and every expense on there. Did you review that? Yes, I did. Is it accurate? Completely accurate. About the monthly profit and loss statements for the audit period, did you review those? Yes, I did. Are they accurate? They are all completely accurate. I review those monthly and I reviewed them again uh, during this audit period. Have you ever rung up any sales of gas that you did not ring up on your register? No. And do you think any of your employees have rung up any amount that are not being recorded on the register? It could happen, but you know, like I said, we do daily checks with the total sales that show up on the Z tape at that time versus the gallons that the underground storage tank uh, say were dispensed. And if there was a difference, you know, we would we would catch it. Hopefully, uh, there's also some theft that takes place. Uh, we don't have the modern credit card uh, machines that they do outside of the pump, so sometimes. Uh, travelers would come and say, turn on pump number one. Um, they'd either give us a credit card or or not. And if the cashier trusted them, uh, they have they have driven off at certain times. So there is some theft that takes place, but we'll document that when that happens. And the cashier will write it on the action sheet for the till. So we can show that there's a difference between what was sold and what we was, was rung up. So I appreciate your honesty in that sense that we can never know for sure if employees are stealing, correct? No, no, because there's there's so many different aspects, but we try to do our best and, and right. monitor the best we can. Right. And that's why they have the state has a procedure called pilferage. They'll give you that for pilferage. But if there's pilferage in gas, you have a second mechanism to make to, to double check that those gas sales match the total because you are tracking the your, your 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 sales daily. So you you know for to lack a better question, it's hard to know if an employee is, is pilferage on general items, but you would know if they're not ringing up gas or ringing up a different price for gas. Correct? Yes, for gas it'd be a lot easier. Like you said, let's say an employee would not ring up a uh, bag of Doritos. Well. We have decent inventory checks, but we don't have the sophisticated POS systems that you know some businesses do. And even in those businesses, it's tough to track. But with gas, it's a lot harder because we see how many gallons were sold that day. And if there's a discrepancy between the Z tape and how many gallons were sold, you know we would question the cashier immediately. And if they don't have an explanation for it, you know we'd have to monitor that cashier and and make sure that it doesn't happen again. But we, we never really had too much of that problem because the cashiers knew that we would check the uh, daily gallons against the total gas uh, rent rung up on the Z tape. Okay. And where do your fuel wholesalers come from? Generally from San Diego, we used a couple, I, I believe back then it was SC fuels and Supreme oil. And when do you change your pricing? Whenever there's an extreme change in the wholesale price, you know, maybe greater than 20 cents, we would have to change our pricing. If there's less than 20 cents changing, we probably would keep it. And then we also monitor the, uh, the competition in the area. Usually they stick with whatever the prices are going on, but if there's a general 20 cents or more change, that's when we would change our price after we get the gas delivered um, and get invoiced for it. 
is your business a pretty consistent or sporadic? It's pretty consistent. I mean, we've been in operations since we've owned it since 1995 and our sales are, are pretty consistent. Uh, can you just not too long, but just a minute or two explain why it's consistent by just giving the, the, the judges just a, a vision of, you know, the store's location and yes. the neighborhood type and how, you know, with, with development and how it's just been the same. If you want to just elaborate, you know, quickly about that. I can't. Uh, in, yes. In so uh, our business Pine Valley store is an, an old store that's been around, uh, I think, since 19, since the 1940s. There's even some uh, photos of horse and buggy where old Highway 80 uh, before the Interstate 8 was was built. Uh, when we took it over, it served as a, a convenience store for the town, which is, I believe, only about 3000 uh, residents. So there's not a lot of business that comes from the town because most people that live there work in the city. Uh, so Pine Valley slowly became uh, a place where people lived and then also a place where people stopped as they're traveling between Arizona and San Diego. Uh, and we've become that small country store serving the community, serving uh, tourists, serving travelers. So what that means is the business is going to be consistent because most travelers that are not business related are traveling during the weekends. Uh, and we have a park behind the store that get that gets busy during the weekends in the summer as well. So it's been pretty consistent. The weekend business is generally more than the weekday business. Um, and since we've owned the store, it hasn't really changed. We've had our ups and downs, but uh, it's 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 been a great store that the community loves that we can serve, and then also be a stop for travelers that run out of gas um, because we're not a big operation. We just have two pumps, and you know we can't compete with let's say the the larger gas stations uh, that are in the El Cajon area, which is about 25 miles west of us. So we're kind of the emergency stop for uh, gas, and then we serve uh, you know homemade pizza and deli sandwiches and so forth to all the travelers. Thank you. And so you just uh, and 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 you so we be, in in a bigger picture, your role. You you had a full time business, and you have a core staff team. And you monitor them daily and you set the gas prices when you're going to change gas prices, correct? Yes, we set them only uh, myself or my father can authorize the, the change of gas, pri gas prices. And would you say um, that your markup um, is pretty consistent year over year? Have you noticed you've changed your markup or have you kept a pretty reasonable markup throughout all these years? I think we've kept a pretty reasonable markup throughout all these years. It's not our core business, but uh, for gas meaning, we're kind of, we put it all together with all the services we offer, but we've been pretty consistent since we've owned the store. And your gas inventory, you can, you can, can you track gas inventory daily? Yes. It's uh, on our UST system at the time, again, uh, we just recently upgraded everything for California regulations, all the underground storage tanks of you probably seen a lot of gas stations with their their ground tore up. But during this time, we had an underground storage tank system that every day we would see how many gallons are in each tank. One, because we needed to monitor when we need to reorder and two to check cross check against what we sold for the day. Okay. And had you ever heard of Opus before this hearing? I have not. How much gas do you consume? How much self-consumption of gas do, 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 do you consume for the out of the business? I would say between 30 to 50 gallons per week on average. Is the business far from your home? It's about 27 miles away from uh, uh, my parents' house and about maybe 32 miles away from, from my house. And going up, it's a big grade because you go from zero to 4,000 feet in 27 miles. So you consume a lot of fuel going uphill and then obviously uh, not as much coming downhill. Okay. And um, when you do, when you get gas for yourself, how does it work? 
uh, we would have the uh, cash share write down uh, on, we have an action sheet because there's some non-cash transactions that take place. If, you know, there's some local businesses that would come in and sign for things and they would pay us at the end of the month. So we'd have to account for that on the daily till. So whatever uh, you know we would consume, we would write it down and enter it into the cash register. So when they see the tapes, we'll see that there was there was some gas uh, acquired by either myself right. or my father. So the so the, the the gas was rung up, but you write a slip that you don't have to provide the cash. So the the cash balances, correct? Correct. Okay, so they would ring up your gas sales. Yes. Okay. What sort of point of sale system do you use? We had at the time a, a general cash register with a scanner. So uh, the cash shares would not have to learn and remember all the prices in the store. It would scan items and then uh, we can total it out or enter in them manually. Uh, and then we had a gas department on that cash register, but it was not connected. Uh, we didn't have the sophisticated POS systems that some of these larger stations do just because of it was it was costly. Um, we had a Gilbarco fuel management system that had our four pumps or our four dispensers with two pumps. And when a customer would come in, they would either buy $20 in gas, we would ring up uh, $20 in gas in the cash register and then type $20 on the Gilbarco system, which would dispense $20 in gas to the uh, to the customer. Um, and other times we would just take credit cards and, and leave them on the on the side until they fill it up. And then they'd come back in and say, we're done with number one. Uh, they bought $47 worth of gas. We would ring it up and, and swipe their credit card. Okay. So as your testimony, your, your, your cash registers provide the pricing and the totals that come out are just in the categories for how much you sold based on the differing categories that you have in the system. Yes. I believe that's been, been our issue with CDTFA is that we didn't have the price per gallon uh on the z tapes and we never had price per gallon unless there were particular instances uh like government employees that required their credit card system to have the price per gallon so those were some of the records that we provided to show we were charging for gas during those times but your daily prices per gas are, are dealt with um it should it, you you every day your system has to have what the price is uh, outside in the system that has to be adjusted yes per the department of weights and measures they would come test our tanks we'd have to have the price per gallon advertised outside uh on a sign that's visible to our customers and then we would get periodic checks from the Department of Weights and Measures to make sure, you know, you're dispensing a gallon is an actual gallon, um, because I think there's been issues or where people have those things tampered with. Um, but for us, yes, we had to advertise the price per gallon. It was registered in our Gilbarco system to dispense how many gallons per uh, dollars that are purchased. Okay. Okay, um, just a few more questions, Mr. Attila. And during the audit period, did you provide all of the fuel purchase invoices? Yes. Uh, did you, uh, were you, did you provide uh, the mini mark purchases cost of goods and consumables for the audit period? Yes, I did. Uh, were they accurate? Yes, they were. Did you provide the daily Z tapes for each and every day for August for 2007, 8, and 9 for the audit period? Yes, I did. Did you provide them all of the bank statements? Yes, we did. Okay. 
And did you provide the tax returns? Yes, we did. And you signed all of those tax returns, correct? Yes. They're all signed under penalty of perjury, correct? Yes, they are. So it is your testimony today that all sales are reported and you have all sales are rung up and reported on your sales tax returns and income tax returns. Yes, they are. We've been very proud, Mr. Shamoon, that throughout our years in business, uh, we've never been audited. This is actually the first time we've actually dealt with something like this. And anytime uh, all of our sales tax uh, reports have always passed with flying colors, we never had any issues with the IRS, FTB, um, and we pride ourselves on, on running a very transparent operation. Uh, that's something that you know my dad has always believed in and has in, in, instilled in his children and all the people that work for him. Um, it's to him, uh, you know, going this far with this was very important just to show that, you know, if we're going to be imputed, if we're going to have in income imputed against us, then so be it. But we want to show <laughs> the CDTFA that we provided everything we can. We're as transparent as we can be. And, you know, we hope that, uh, that they side with us. Okay. I have no more further questions, Your Honor. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Shimon, are, does this complete your presentation as well, or do you have anything further? Well, I have the closing argument, so I'd love to make some arguments now besides the opening statement, but I do have a closing state closing argument that I'd like to close with. Uh, okay, well, uh, then we will wait for that closing. You'll have the opportunity to uh, present that closing argument uh, after CDTFA's uh, presentation. Yes. Uh, this is Judge Wong. First, I would like to offer CDTFA an opportunity to cross-examine uh, Mr. Atala. This is Randy Spazza. We have the questions. This is Judge Wong. Thank you. Now I will turn to my co-panelists to see if they have any questions for either Mr. Shamoon or Mr. Atala, starting with Judge Geary. Uh, thank you. Um, this is Judge Geary. I think I just have one question for Mr. Atala. Um, Mr. Atala, you mentioned um, competitors, and I think you said in El Cajon, approximately 25 miles to the west. But you also mentioned a casino somewhere. Where is that casino, and in what ways uh, is it a competitor in terms of gas sales in that in your region? It's about I think uh, ten miles or less east of us. I have to look up the map. It's called Golden Acorn Casino, uh, and then there's also a uh, Shell and Chevron gas station between us and Golden Acorn that's right off the freeway. And then there's, I think, one or two gas stations in the back country uh, that are closer to us that are smaller businesses. And, you uh, know, the casinos give away their gas, as, as you know, to bring in players. So they're one of our people we have to, one of the competitors we have to watch. And um, actually, I have one other question, or perhaps a series of questions about one, one other topic, and it has to do with the Z tapes. I think that you you mentioned that um, your Z tapes do not indicate the price per gallon of the product sold, unless it's a government employee, because for some reason they're required to provide that information. Is that correct? Yes, it's it not on the Z tapes. It would be on the credit card receipt for that government employee. I think we provided several. Uh, when the government employee would come in, they use these cards. I believe they were called Voyager cards during that time. And when they run their credit card through the machine, the, the credit card machine would have to have the price of gas and how many gallons purchased 
just so they could show their superior that they're, you know, what they're getting and what they paid for gas that day. Uh, Judge Gary again, and um, for those government employees who swipe their cards and receive that kind of information on their receipts, the Z tapes would still just show the total, uh, the total amount of, of price paid for the gas. Is that right? Exactly. It would show the total, the total gross dollars received for gas that day for all gallons sold. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Judge Wong. Those are the only questions I have. This is Judge Wong. Thank you, Judge Geary. Uh, Judge Cho, do you have any questions for either Mr. Shamoon or the witness? This is Judge Cho. Just a couple of quick questions for Mr. Otala. Uh, Mr. Otala, you mentioned something about a Gil Barco uh, gas system. And I was wondering, how do you set the price on that? You said it's a separate system from the POS register system, correct? Yes. So when your prices that you changed outside of the, the gas station, the price that the consumers see, how do you change the price on the Gilbarco system? Do you have a separate machine? No, it's, it's done through the system. It's pretty complicated um, because you have to enter all these codes. So what we would do typically when we have a change in price in gas, before we go change it on the street, we would change it with the Gilbarco system. Um, you'd have to put these codes in. It's a lot easier today, but back then you'd have to put these codes in. And then for each type of gas that you sell, uh, let's say we only had unleaded gas. So we had regular, mid-grade, and super. You'd have to go to each category on the Gilbarco system and put, you know, if you raise the gas 20 cents, you know, unleaded, raise 20 cents, mid-grade, raise 20 cents, and super, raise 20 cents. Once you do that correctly, it would register that price on the machines outside. So the, the customers would see the price of gas for each category on the buttons that you press. And then we would go change the, the numbers on the sign outside. This is Judge Cho. Thank you for the explanation. So is it a separate, like a computer terminal inside of your, inside of your um, convenience store? Or is it something you can do remotely? You cannot do it remotely back then. I mean, I don't know today if, if you can with the newer systems. But back then it was, it looked like a, uh, I don't have a picture of it, but it looked like a, you know, uh, a large, you know, probably about this big uh, little uh, system with a bunch of, uh, a bunch of buttons. And, and then you could see like the different readouts for each pump. So pump one, pump two, pump three, pump four would be in red and the prices. So when somebody would come in and give us a, uh, let's say $20, we would take that $20, ring it up in the register and go to the Gobarco and put pump number one, $20, enter, and it would dispense $20 worth of gas on pump number one. This is Judge Cho. Thank you. So did that Gilbarco system have any kind of a record keeping ability? Did it tell you like your average, uh, did it have any kind of printout of any sort or yeah. any kind of way of accessing the data? No, only that uh, we would be able to see what gallons we sold per day. That was tied into our underground storage tank system. So every morning, whoever opens would come and take the readout of how many gallons are in the uh, tanks. And we would compare that with the previous days and we would know how many gallons of gas were dispensed. This is Judge Cho. Thank you for the explanation. Those are the only questions that I had. This is Judge Wong. Thank you. Uh, I think I only had one or two questions for Mr. Atala. So um, you described the location of your gas station. I just wanted to um, probe that a little bit. So is it near is it near an off ramp for a freeway or a highway, or is it um, located at a cross section or? We're about one mile uh, off the freeway, off the Pine Valley exit. So you can't see our store from the freeway. Um, but yeah, you know, there's people know it's there, not like the, uh, the casino, which has a huge sign right on the freeway and the Chevron and the shell, which have huge signs right on the freeway. So we're on old highway 80, which is the old highway that, uh, was pre, pre was a predecessor to, uh, interstate eight. This is judge Wong and how close, 
how close are your nearest competitors? Like within the what mile radius or half mile radius is? Do you, are you do you know that? Uh, I don't know exactly, Judge Juan, but I can estimate if you like. Um, sure. Uh, I and I think this could easily be you know found on Google, but uh, there's Golden Acorn. I, I think it's ten miles. Uh, there's the Chevron and um, and Shell uh, that's between us and Golden Acorn, maybe like seven or eight miles. There's a, a store in Descanso, the Descanso Junction, that's probably about four miles away from us. Um, and then, you know, there, I think there might be one more uh, around Julian, which is, it's, it's not so far in miles, but it's far in having to turn and go through the mountain to get there. This is Judge Wong. Thank you. And do you, um, do you or, or some of your employees keep track of what your competitors are charging for gasoline? And if so, how did you do that? Well, today it's much easier with the internet. They have this thing called Gas Buddy. So you don't even have to go anywhere. You can just log on and you can see what everybody's charging. But back then, um, you know, one of us kind of always went up the mountain during the week. So we would check the major, uh, you know, the, the, sell, the casino, we would check uh, the Descanso market. And we would check also the prices in El Cajon, which are really low for the city. They're probably one of the lowest, uh, I would say, in all of San Diego County. So we would we would check all those prices and kind of get a general idea of what's going on in the market. It wasn't a you know foolproof way to kind of know if you're being competitive, but you know you, you knew you were within the range of your surrounding uh, competitors. This is Judge Wong, and that was done on a weekly basis or every couple of days. I would say probably every couple of days, um, but we would also know Judge Wong when we get a change in the wholesale price, because usually when prices stay steady, the competitors wouldn't change too much because everybody's doing what they're doing. But when prices would change, um, when we would get a price change, then we would go to make sure what everybody's selling for. And there were times where, you know, sometimes we would buy gas at a higher price and we wouldn't be able to raise our price because the competitor had bought it a week before and they had that week to make a little bit of their margin or didn't raise their price. So there were times where we actually broke even or even lost money during those periods. This is Judge Wong. Thank you very much. That's all the questions I had for now. Uh, now we will turn to CDTFA for their presentation. You have 20 minutes. Thank you. This is Randy Squazzo. The appellant operates a gas station with a convenience store and takeout restaurant in Pine Valley, California. The appellant has three main revenue streams for taxable sales. Taxable sales of food, fuel, taxable mini mart sales, and taxable sales of pizza. The business is located near on and off ramps for Interstate 8. The department performed an audit examination for the period of April 1, 2007 through March 31, 2010. This was the appellant's first audit. The appellant provided federal income tax returns for years 2007, 2008, 2009, monthly income statements, and very few sales invoices to customers for the audit period. Initial comparison of recorded sales per income statements revealed no differences with amounts per appellant's sales and use tax returns. Exhibit D, page 112. The department's computation of audited taxable sales includes separate calculations for fuel sales, taxable mini mart sales, restaurant sales, and a disallowed, disallowed claimed exempt food exemption. The pizza sales were considered reasonable and accepted. Taxable mini mart sales were calculated by the appellant by segregating taxable and non taxable mini mart purchases and marking up recorded taxable mini mart purchases by 35% and reporting sales tax on the calculated sales. Exhibit D, pages 102 and 103. Review of the appellant segregation disclosed that some taxable items were segregated as non-taxable. Therefore, an adjustment was made. Computation of the disallowed claimed food exemption is based on the actual cost of taxable items misclassified as exempt food products. Misclassified purchases 
were marked up using the same 35% markup as recorded taxable sales. Both the cost amounts and the estimated market percentage were provided by the appellant. Exhibit D, pages 106 to 109. Audited taxable sales were calculated using the appellant's actual gallons of fuel purchased and applying quarterly average per gallon sales prices per fuel grade, adjusted for appellant's price differentials. A markup approach was not used to establish audited fuel sales. Since appellant did not have records of its fuel prices for the audit period, the department had to estimate the sales prices. The department obtained weekly retail gallon sales prices of fuel from the United States Department of Energy, Exhibit F. The, United the U.S. Department of Energy is a federal agency that provides independent statistics and analysis of fuel selling prices. Separate data is available for each state and for certain large cities or regions, including the Los Angeles and San Francisco regions. No separate data is available for San Diego County. The department noted that the per gallon selling prices per U.S. Department of Energy for Los Angeles region were less than statewide averages. Therefore, the department transcribed weekly Los Angeles region fuel prices for all grades of gas for the period of January 1, 2001 through March, May 17, 2010. The department then computed the average monthly and quarterly per gallon prices, Exhibit D, page 74 to 87. The quarterly per gallon selling, pr per gallon selling prices for U.S. Department of Energy were weighted using percentages provided by the appellant. That is 82% for regular fuel, 8% for mid-grade, and 10% for premium fuel, Exhibit D, pages 72 and 73. The department then obtained per gallon, selling, per gallon selling prices information for the appellant's gas station for the most for most of the audit period, second quarter 2007 through fourth quarter 2009, from Oil Price Information Service, often referred to as OPUS. OPUS is a company that collects and provides actual sales prices for gas stations. The OPUS information obtained on um, exhibit D, page 88, are the appellant's average selling prices observed for the sale of regular fuel at the appellant's gas station by quarter. The department compared the appellant's average quarterly per gallon sales price for regular fuel and U.S. Department of Energy average per gallon selling prices for regular fuel for the co corresponding periods. The department found that the appellant's per gallon selling prices were anywhere from 31 cents to 57 cents more than the U.S. Department of Energy average per gallon selling prices. This means the appellant charged an overall 13.82% greater amount charged per gallon than U.S. Department of Energy reported for the Los Angeles area, Exhibit D, page 88. The quarterly weighted per gallon sell selling prices per U.S. Department of Energy were increased by quarterly price differential to obtain the weighted per gallon sales price per period. For the first quarter of 2010, OPUS information was not available, so the average price differential is used. The department multiplied the weighted per gallon sales price, net of sales tax, with the gallons of fuel purchased to compute audit taxable sales of fuel for the audit period, Exhibit D, page 72. The department then combined all audited sales of fuel, mini mart and restaurant, to arrive at audit taxable measure. After credit for reported taxable sales, understated taxable sales of over $174,000 was noted. In support of the audited understatement, the department offers the following. During the audit period, the appellant provided the department with nine receipts that showed examples of what they charged customers. The decision and recommendation dated March 16, 2016, noted that by using the appellant supplied receipts, the assessment would go up 
has the overall price differential based on opus of 13.82% would increase to 18%, which would increase the established liability. Exhibit A, page 13. As part of the appeals process on September 4, 2020, the appellant provided documentation that included additional gasoline sales receipts for 13 customers with applicable, with applicable gasoline purchase invoices for the, from the appellant suppliers. The receipts and purchase invoices were from December 15, 2008 through December 18, 2009, a full one-year period. Review of the exhibits disclosed markups ranging from a low of 18.93% to a high of 35.33%. The average markup for this one year time period was 24.97%, which is almost identical to the audited markup of 24.98% for the audited mark for the 2009 period, Exhibit H and Exhibit I. This analysis shows that audited amounts are accurate and reasonable. The analysis also disclosed that the appellant's recorded markups are not reliable. Exhibit D, page 91. If the appellant's 24.9% markup, Exhibit H, page 214, is applied to audited purchases for the audit period, fuel sales would increase to almost $3.2 million and unreported taxable sales would be 419,000 instead of the 174,000 computed by the auditor, thereby increasing the assessment by $245,000. The appellant continues to, contend, continues to contend the U.S. Department of Energy prices for Los Angeles are greater than would be found in Pine Valley. The department's evidence shows the opposite. Again, during the appeals procedure process, the appellant provided copies of credit card receipts obtained from customers who they stated who were stated to be by the appellant government employees making purchases of unleaded fuel. Exhibit G, pages 200 to 208. It is unknown if these customers were provided a special rate as government employees or if these were the appellant's normal selling prices. A comparison of, of the sales prices for the nine credit card receipts covering mid December 2008 through November 2009, with corresponding U.S. Department of Energy selling prices for the Los Angeles region, Exhibit F, page 192, shows an overall increased price differential of over 41 cents per gallon, Exhibit A, page 48, meaning the appellant's sales prices were on average more than 41 cents per gallon higher than the average sales price for the U.S. Department of Energy amounts for the Los Angeles region. The OPUS price differential for the same time period was almost identical. The department also conducted a search of the appellant's stated sales prices for, uh, for fuel on the internet and found gasoline fuel prices for five separate dates. Exhibit G, pages 209 to 213. The department compared the appellant's weighted sales prices by grade to corresponding U.S. Department of energy's stated prices. Exhibit F, pages 209 to 213. Sorry, excuse me. All prices for all grades sold by the appellant were higher than the Los Angeles prices. Thus, evidence shows the appellant's selling prices of fuel is greater than the Los Angeles region U.S. Department of, A of Energy averages. The price differential used in the audit based on OPUS is reasonable and fair. It should be noted again that the audit method is based on the number of gallons purchased and the sales price per gallon. The department did not mark up uh, the dollar value purchased as a gasoline, and therefore a change in the appellant's markup on each gallon does not impact the accuracy of the department's audit results. In addition, for the audit period, the department used the appellant's actual sales prices per opus pricing to calculate average quarterly sales prices for each grade of gasoline which were then multiplied by gallons of gasoline purchased as calculated from the amount of sales tax per gallon the appellant prepaid to its gasoline vendors. The department reasonably accounted for the appellant's price changes throughout the audit period. And therefore, these price changes do not impact the accuracy of the audit results. 
Further, appellant has provided no better sales price information, which can be used to calculate more accurate gasoline sales prices per gallon during the audit period. As to the appellant's argument concerning the ratios of gasoline grade used, the department used the ratios provided by the appellant in the appeals conference, Exhibit D, page 73. Even though the appellant provided no records from within the audit period from which to establish these ratios, appellant has not provided any basis for their current desire to use a different ratio. In summary, appellant failed to provide necessary records for the audit. The department's indirect testing and evidence presents, presented show the appellant has understated their taxable sales liability. The appellant has not provided any substantive documentation to support adjustments to the audit findings. Therefore, the department requests that the appellant's appeal be denied. This concludes my presentation. I am available to answer any questions you may have. This is Judge Wong. Thank you. I'll now turn to my co-panelists for any questions they may have for CDPFA, starting with Judge Geary. Um, I, I have no questions for this uh, for for the department. Thank you. Ms. Judge Wong, thank you. Judge Cho, do you have any questions for CDTFA? This is Judge Cho. Just a couple of questions. According to appellant, they said they provided all of the Z tapes to CDTFA. Um, is that correct, CDTFA? Uh, I believe they, they they did supply Z tapes. The problem with the Z tapes is they didn't have the price per gallon. Most of the time when you get a POS report, it's going to have that. And at, at the end of every shift change, normally what happens at a gas station is you will have a uh, gallon sold times selling price to see if, uh, to get the, the sales of the gallon to make sure that the, um, the, the person in charge of the register is um, bringing it up correctly. And there's no shortage. That was not provided. They sh there should have been worksheets on a daily basis for every shift change available along with the P since they didn't have a POS system. Okay, this is just show. Thank you for the explanation. So, so because it didn't have the price per gallon, CDTFA, it's your position that those Z tapes are unreliable. Is that correct? That would be accurate. Okay, this is Judge Cho, thank you. Um, but is there any dispute as to appellant's prior testimony that where, where Mr. Atala kind of explained the process and he stated that they would kind of reconcile at the end of the day, all the gallons that were sold. And he said that because of the, type of sale here, which is sales of fuel, that it'd be very difficult for the employee or anybody to make an error with respect to uh, the sale of gasoline. Does the department, have, does the department have any um, kind of response to that testimony today? That's why you would have a, a worksheet if you didn't have it on a POS system. So that you would see number of gallons sold times selling price for the shift to equal the number of um, uh, the dollar value of sales for uh, regular, for premium, and for um, the mid the mid grade. That way, when they balance out at the end of the night, you would balance it back to the register plus the food sales plus the pizza sales plus the taxable foods uh, taxable items such as beer, liquor, whatever, what have you. And it would balance out. So you would have to have that to make sure that you're not being shortchanged. This if they is didn't true. have that, that would be that would be a reason why they're why they can't find the difference. This is Judge Show. Thank you very much. That's the only question that I had. Thank you, Judge Show. This is Judge Wong. Uh, I also had a couple questions for CDTFA. Could you address appellant's uh, argument for self-consumption and shrinkage allowances? The self-consumption, you would still have to pay tax on the uh, on the cost of the gas. So, you know, you would only save on the on the markup portion, or I guess the markup portion of the difference between the uh, 
what the gas was purchased at and what it was selling at, this, uh, depending on if it was rung up at all. And the other thing about the shrinkage, um, well, concern, um, basically, I'll just read what I have here. Um, request for uh, spillage and evaporation adjustments. The department first notes that the appellant has presented no calculations or documents to establish the amount or frequency of these types of gasoline losses that it alleges occurred during the audit period. Thus, appellant has failed to quantify its request for an allowance. Next, the department uh, considers possible reasons for such alleged losses of gasoline. If spillage occurred during delivery by suppliers to the appellant's tanks, we would expect the appellant would receive a reduction in number of gallons delivered with the corresponding price reduction or credit on its final purchase invoice. Therefore, this scenario would already be accounted for in the department's audit method. Based on the actual number of gallons successfully delivered, if spillage occurred when a customer is filling his or her vehicle tank, this spilled gasoline was first purchased by the customer and sold by the appellant when it passed through the uh, meter in the pump. So regardless if, the, if some gasoline is occasionally spilled by customers, the appellant nevertheless sold the spilled gasoline, prompting sales tax to be due on the entire sale. That's if you had a... Uh, uh, a prepay. Uh, if he didn't have a prepay, I doubt that, seriously doubt that uh, there would be much spillage at all that they would give a customer an allowance for because once you start spilling a little bit, you're going to stop. You're not going to spill over like a quarter of a gallon or a tenth of a gallon because you'll end up smelling like gasoline. Um, so you would automatically stop. Uh, so I Think that addresses your concern there? It's Judge Wong, thank you. Uh, and I just had an, uh, one last question regarding um, a line in the decision recommendation. So uh, CTFA calculated a book markup of 14.35% for gasoline for the audit period, but uh, the DNR mentions that CTFA expected a higher than average book markup around 20% for gasoline. And I just was wondering how CDTFA arrived at that 20% uh, markup. Um, basically, if you were to look at the markup, if you were to get the invoices that they supplied us, and then you look at the, uh, at the purchases that you have to go against those uh, receipts that they supplied us, it's showing 24.98%. So you're asking them to accept 14 point something versus 24.98, which is already you know, shown to be there. And that's an exhibit, I believe that's exhibit H. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Randy. I believe that's an exhibit H when we calculate the markup after they uh, gave us the items. It was calculated out for the 2000, end of 2008, almost end of 2009 period to 24.98. You look at exhibit H. And what the recorded markup was after you take out the uh, tax included in the prepay, it's 14.98. So the overall audited markup, I believe is on page 91. Exhibit D, page 91, recorded markup for the three-year audit period. If you look at the recorded book markup, it's 14.35. If you look at the post-audit markup, it's 21.57. So, and again, if you look at the Exhibit H, it's actually 24.97 for that last period, which is almost identical to the 24.98 uh, post-audit markup. It's a hundredth of a percent off. And that is based on the nine receipts. These are just based on the nine That's, receipts that we found that compared to Opus pricing for that date, did, correct? Hi, this is hi, this is Judge Wong. Uh, you'll have, a, Mr. Uh, sorry, Mr. Shamoon, you'll have a chance to um, address CFA's <laughs> arguments on your rebuttal and closing. Uh, right now it's just, um, questions by the panel for CDTFA um, on their arguments. 
Yeah, I'm sorry, Your Honor. I just wanted to clarify just for all of us to understand what <laughs> claiming markup that that was just based on. I just wanted to make sure that you understood that it was just based on those nine receipts. And I just I apologize, Your Honor. I should not have interrupted. Sorry. This is wrong. No, it's okay. Thank you. That's um, why it was important for the, the taxpayer to have the actual prices on a daily basis, if you know, at best. That way they could they would be able to show. However, like I said before, normally if you're doing a gas station back in the day, well, back in the late seventies, early eighties, when I was running a gas when I was doing a gas station, you always had a worksheet at the end of the shift. And you would multiply the number of gallons that comes off the little um there's a little meter reader uh, times the average selling times the, the price per gallon to calculate your sales of unleaded, premium, mid range. It totaled them all up. And then that would be your gasoline seller prices. He should have had a worksheet, something like that, that he provided to the auditor because that would clarify what the prices were for unleaded, mid, and premium. He did not supply that. I don't know if he didn't have it or they don't use it. But that would that would have helped him greatly. If he would have had a POS system, that would have also helped him greatly. Um, this is Judge Wong. Um, oh, Mr. Parker, you had you were interjecting. Did you want to? Yeah, thank you, uh, Judge Wong. Uh, this is Jason Parker. I just wanted to add on that um, when we conduct the audits, um, we noticed that the uh, recorded markup was around 14%. The 20% is based on the auditor's knowledge of conducting similar types of uh, businesses audits and the, the field office's knowledge of that area. So they, their understanding was that the markup that was recorded was lower than what they expected. So they needed to do further investigation and testing. And that's what warranted it. Not that we were looking to mark it up 20%. That was just their knowledge to warrant further investigation. And again, the um, the audit is not based on a markup. The audit is based on selling price times gallons. That's not a markup. This Judge Wong, thank you. Um, I know that Mr. Swazo has made some statement, like factual statements regarding his own personal experience, I guess, in the 70s and 80s and what should have done. I just wanted to note that Mr. Suazo is not under oath and is not testifying to any facts unless he wants to be subject to no. Okay. Just want to clarify. Thank you. Sorry about that. No, no worries. Okay. Uh, that's all the questions I had for CDTFA. And now uh, it's uh, appellant's opportunity to offer rebuttal and closing uh, remarks. Uh, and you have 15 minutes for that. You actually have a little leeway because you didn't use all of your time on opening. Uh, Mr. Shamoon your rebuttal and closing remarks. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, I wish that we had the opportunity to um, cross, uh, to have the testimony of the actual auditor. If this was a, a normal trial, I would object to um, just the prior comments as hearsay if we're gonna be making comments of what the auditor was, you know, thinking or doing or, or how they were, were, were handling this. Um, we had, we had requested the auditor to be here, um, so that we would not have to go off the written documents as to what took place. But unfortunately we were denied that opportunity to bring the auditor here. I felt it was imperative that we talk to the auditor about why why they felt it was necessary to use opus when adequate records were provided. If you look at the overall theme right now of just the previous statements that were stated by the respondent, it's a, a method of there are some people who have would write down their daily total on a per day basis. There's examples of 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 of, of records that could have been and would have proven what the actual daily prices were. But we were missing the big picture here. It's what this is not required. And if it's not required, and I know, it, although it was not helpful, then um, 
it should not be a factor that you guys take into consideration. In a nutshell, based on my 20 years of experience, I know of no successful argument regarding the use of OPUS selling prices. The CDTFA has successfully hidden behind the fact that the OPUS methodology is not obtainable. In anticipation of this hearing, we subpoenaed OPUS to get their methodology and the records as to how they come up with the prices, how accurate they come up with the prices, and just to get some more validating information as to the validity of OPUS, why it's used, and why the government used it uses it. Unfortunately, we've got nothing. Nothing was submitted in an exhibit to this hearing as to OPUS, why it's used, its validity, um, and why it is still relevant till today. They have provided a, a, a third party, the, the government, the state has provided a third party system with no backup, no authentication, nothing to prove why it's relevant, it's methodology, and whether it's even accurate. We have nothing admitted into evidence today about OPUS overall. But the underlying question becomes is why do we use OPUS? Simply, why do we use OPUS? On page five, lines 15 through 16, the CDTFA stated that petitioner did not provide any source documents such as cash register tapes. However, in the audit comments, exhibit E, page 144, state that cash register Z tapes were provided. Z tapes are a summary of sales. The report is misleading and that they should have said a daily Z tape that has every single sales item that lists the retail price for everything was not provided. No, it was not provided, nor do we have those records, nor do we have the capability. The only books, the records of books that were provided were daily cash register tapes. So the department could verify so that, but they could not provide the daily selling prices. On page 11, lines 15 through 18 of exhibit A, it states petitioner provided nine sales receipts, source documents for sales during the audit period. The department concluded that the retail selling price of the fuel Per those nine receipts were substantially consistent with petitioners average selling prices obtained by Opus. And then therefore OP gave some credibility to Opus's pricing. Bottom line is CDTFA is justified in using alternative methods. When there's a basis of no supporting documents. As you'll see in exhibit E. Page 44, petitioner provided books and records. So everything, everything that is required by, by an individual to provide daily receipts, bank statements that match, tax returns that match sales tax returns, no unreported deposits, everything accurately. We were able to provide nine sales receipts that we found. We were hopeful that if we could find that receipt and look at Google Street View and get the date and find something that would show to them that what we are selling, show to the state of what we are selling on that day matched that receipt. Unfortunately, it's hard to sometimes back and put something together when you never knew you had to do it in the first place. Petitioner, we, my, our main argument, the CDTFA is not justified in using an alternative method to calculate sales because adequate records were produced, including source documents. We could run inferences. The state could run inferences on average markup or what they should have done. But as we all know, every store is different. We try to draw similarities and we do this when we don't have records, when you don't have sales, 
when you have excess deposits, not when you have a clean and set, accurate set of books with an additional protocol that there could not be theft by an employee because it would be noticed in the tracking of the total sales. It makes our argument stronger that it's sales than trying to come up and make this argument with you on average markup for a business uh, in a store. I, this is not that. And we have to be clear. We could look at the markup. We could look at this. We could look at all how we try to see if Opus is correct. But as the state just said, the adjustment was made simply by taking fuel purchases, which is good. It's a pretty accurate. I mean, you got purchase sales numbers. So that will fluctuate as far as, you know, you got purchases of gallons. This is your selling price. So that would account for all that. But the bottom line is our selling price is what he recorded and what we provided sales tax on. All source documents were given. There is not enough reason to not take the documents that were provided and claim falsely that adequate books and records were not provided. There is nothing that was not provided that this individual taxpayer provided. Even cost of goods sold, receipts were given. They looked at everything. It was not ultimately until they um, decided to use the OPUS numbers to create a liability. When the CDTFA uses alternate methods to establish sales, it's been their longstanding policy of the CDTFA to use two or more methods to estimate sales. Comparing the results of one method against the results of another method. The audit manual 0407.05 indicates the following sources of information and procedures have been found useful in determining probable sales. Bank deposits, section 0405.25, they were provided. Gross profit and net worth analysis test, section 0406.4, Income tax returns, section 0406.5, purchase plus markup. If enough of information is available to do so, the auditor should use two or more of these methods to come up with an alternate method. That was not done here. Bank statements were also provided and they were ignored. The CDTFA speculated here, purely speculated. One speculation was the amount of income the taxpayer made. $100,000 per year was the profit. It was looked at as if it was odd. We don't have, It's this is one of those cases where let the documents speak for themselves. I'm not here as the attorney, and even to prepare for this, it was difficult to create an argument. Our argument is we provided everything. We've given the government everything. There isn't any reason to believe that this taxpayer underreported sales. They were accurate. All records were provided. One methodology was used, which is Opus pricing, based on speculation that the store should have an IR markup, the store should this, and loose, loose analogies, not really relevant to the overall case. Yes, we worked on it a long time. And when I wanted to bring a representative from the agent to talk about Opus, to talk about when it's used and how often and why, we were denied that opportunity. And when I wanted the opportunity to bring the auditor here to see why it was used and why they felt that what was provided was not adequate, we get hearsay statements provided by the two individuals uh, from the state 
regurgitating what they read through the audit report. The documents speak for themselves. All sales were recorded. Many methodologies were looked at to see if there's any underreported sales. It wasn't, this was the last draw of the auditor. I was there during the audit 10 years ago, and I still remember it. And we ended up at Opus because all other methodologies didn't work to create a liability. We believe that the CDTFA has not fulfilled their burden, have not fulfilled the requirements to use alternate methods, and should not assess an additional tax to the petitioner in this case. This is Judge Wong. Does that complete your closing and re your rebuttal and closing, Mr. Shamoon? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Thank you. And now I will turn to my panel for any final questions well, that they I, may have for the yeah, parties. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Can I make one final comment? I'm so sorry. Is it, sure. Uh, this is Judge Wong. Go ahead, Mr. Shamoon. Yes, thank you, Judge. Um, I wanted to just comment real quick. Um, we, we talked about the two issues as far as uh, pill fridge and uh, self consumption. And I wanted to just give our arguments on those two points that I forgot to touch on in my closing. The, the paper was underneath. Um, an adjustment should be made for shrinking of inventory to account for pill fridge, spoilage, theft, natural disasters, fire losses were applicable. When shrinkage is present, the state can allow up to 1% of the cost of these items. Um, we would argue to at least if an adjustment, full adjustment is not made, but an adjustment to be made for uh, pill fridge. And also one fact that I would like to point out is that the selling prices obtained by Opus, the Department of Energy are Selling, and I would have loved to have provided more information, but they don't give you any information. But this is, we do know, is that their selling prices are for every Monday. So they track their selling prices for every Monday. The monthly average selling price is computed by adding the selling prices from every Monday and dividing it by the number of Mondays in the month. And the quarterly average selling prices for Opus are set up by these monthly Monday averages. Because Opus uses a Monday daily average. And we had submitted other evidence and it's submitted in our written brief as to arguments on the dates that they found the receipts on prices that we feel that Opus is flawed and that even its methodology of attracting only Mondays is not really reflective. And uh, if, you know, our main argument is we should not have to use Opus. Um, and attacking it in that way is that it is, we don't need opus. Um, however, if it is applied, I do like to just call out the flaw in opus being used um, in the sense that it tracks uh, pricing every Monday. But for all intents and purposes, it's not whether opus is valid, although I point that there are we can't prove its strength and we, we, we can't prove its validity and its methodology and therefore it should not be used. But at the very least, I don't want to stray. We provided accurate records. We don't need to be using Opus to determine what our sales are. Thank you. This is Judge Wong. Thank you, Mr. Shamoon. And now I'll turn to uh, my panel for any final questions that they might have for either uh, appellant or CDTFA. Uh, Mr. Atala, are you also available to answer any questions that the panel might have? Any final questions? Yes, I'm here still. This is just wrong. Thank you. And just to remind you if uh, that you're still under oath, if the panel does have any questions for you, I'll turn to Judge Geary for any final questions. This is Judge Geary. I don't have any questions at this time, but Judge Wong, could you circle back to me after Judge Cho uh, in the event, if he asks questions in the event, I have some follow up. This is Judge Wong, certainly. Thank you. Judge Cho, any questions for uh, either party or the witness? This is Judge Cho. Yes, uh, I had a question for Mr. Atala. So, after I had asked Mr. Swazo about the Z tapes and why they're not reliable, 
he explained that in order to, to, I guess, reconcile the two, you would need to know the sales price. So I was wondering, when you reconcile at, on a daily basis, you have your total gallons sold, and I believe you said you got that from the Guild Barco system, and then you have your total sales that you received from your POS or register, from the register system. How did you ensure that those two numbers matched without knowing the sales price for the day? We do know the sales price for the day, Your Honor. Every day, we, I mean, the sales price is advertised and it's on our Gilbarco system. So we do know what the sales price is every day. So did you record that? No, we would just we would just double check it every single day with the Z tapes to make sure the sales are in line with how many gallons were dispensed from the tanks. This is Judge Show. Thank you. And then how about those days when the price would change somewhere in the middle of the day or or some time during the day? Because you'd have, I guess, one sales price in the morning, and then I'm assuming a different sales price later on in the day without knowing the change without recording it any in anywhere in any location because you said the Gil Barco system doesn't keep a, a record of the changes. How did you reconcile those days? We would only change prices uh, at the end of the day before the next shift starts. We never change prices during midday. That wouldn't be a good business practice anyways for us since people might have paid a different price right before they they came before we made the change. This is Judge Show. Okay, gotcha. So you would base your reconciliation of the gallons to total sales on the Gil Barco price that you saw at the end of the day. Is that correct? Yeah, we would do we would have one price for that day and then we would make the change. So the next day would be only one price. We never had a day where there were two different prices being paid in the same uh, Z tape. Okay, this is Judge Shah. Thank you very much for the explanation. Those are all the questions that I have. This is Judge Wong. Uh, Mr. Todd, did the gas station operate 24 hours or did they have an opening and closing time? Opening and closing time. Do you know what those were at the, uh, during the audit period? We've changed them, uh, Judge Wong, since COVID. And, you know, I can't be certain 15 years ago, but typically we would open at 6 a.m., and we would close at, I believe, uh, 10 p.m. during the weekdays. And on Fridays and Saturdays, we'd stay open an extra hour till like 11 p.m. This is Judge Wong. So when you did change uh, the price of gasoline, it took place after, when the business was closed. Is that correct? My, that's my understanding of what you're saying. Or, be or before we opened in well, the morning. This is Judge Wong. Thank you. Uh, and I'll turn to... Judge Geary for any final questions. Thank you, Judge Wong. This is Judge Geary. I actually have a couple of questions for Mr. Shimon. Um, it, it sounds like um, the appellant is arguing that it was denied an opportunity to obtain testimony from the auditor, and it was denied an opportunity to provide evidence um, relating to OPUS and where and how it gets its information and whether or not that information is accurately reported. And I want to inquire of Mr. Shamoon, um, who denied you an opportunity to obtain information from the auditor? Well, we, uh, I, I will deter, uh, defer to uh, a co-counsel, Shadar Dib. I, I didn't think she would uh, um, testify. I, I, I could speak to her or should I have her introduce herself and just answer that question because she was more in tune of, of, of requesting their presence uh, at, at the trial today. But do you, um... so, so this no, is... no, no, hold on for a second. I, I don't want to take testimony from anybody. That's really okay. your prerogative to offer testimony, but you stated in your yeah, okay. remarks and how is it that, that you came okay. to believe that, no that you were denied an opportunity to obtain testimony from the auditor? No, no problem here. I will answer that question. Okay. We requested to, to judge Wong. Uh, 
in our initial witness list who we want to call as a witness. We listed the auditor as a witness and it was uh, denied twice by Judge Wong. Did you issue a subpoena to the auditor? Yes, we did. What happened with that subpoena? It was denied by the judge. Are you, are you an attorney, Mr. Schmidt? Yes. You can issue a subpoena. Did you personally issue a subpoena to that witness? No, no, I didn't. When I, I, I did requested it, no, I did not. And you said that a subpoena was issued to Opus. Is that correct? No, just request for information was issued to them. Okay. The methodology. And you, so you never issued a subpoena to that organization to request information or to request the person most knowledgeable to testify at this hearing. We did not via subpoena. We did request uh, via email and via letter to provide information, and they did respond saying they do not provide any details on how they come up with their pricing. So they did respond. You were referring, this is my last area of inquiry, at least. You referred in your closing comments, it looked like you were referring to documents as you were describing how Opus um, does its calculations and, and you specifically referred to um, them obtaining information regarding Monday sales um, prices. Um, did you receive some written information from Opus about about that particular matter? Yes. Is is that information um, part of your evidentiary package, your one of your exhibits? It's already in the CDTFA's exhibit G. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, those are the only questions. Your Honor, I did not issue a subpoena. I had asked for the court to allow the witness testimony. When the court denied it, I did not subpoena the witness because. I, I, I just, I thought because I'd already requested in our witness list and it was denied to call as a witness that my subpoena would not. If the judge is not going to allow the testimony, I did not want to do that because I did not feel it would. Would 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 work really in this, you know, administrative hearing and that I could, you know, force the person to appear. With the with the with the subpoena, but if we're not going to allow the testimony as being you know already been provided, and, and it's not going to lead to additional information, that was the analysis. I did not go that route because I felt that in the end, the ju you know a judge is going to have to allow allow this per se. So I could have organically got the um, auditor there. But I could not, you know, control the the the, the allowed testimony of, of of the witness. Does that make sense? Yes, I understand. You referred to a court. In fact, you were referring, I take it, to Judge Wong and to OTA. Yeah, I'm sorry. All right. You always get, you know, you got administrative hearings, courts. I I, I apologize, but yes. I and then in regards to Opus, I did not issue a subpoena. Their, their letter was basically, we don't provide our proprietary information It's provided on Mondays and we don't tell you how we come up with it and we're not going to give it to you. And so I did not, you know, press them uh, further um, to do that. Thank you, Mr. Schumer. Those are my only questions. They did request that we get it from the CDTFA, their methodology, but we did request it from the CDTFA of how they come up with this methodology. But we never did receive that information. Your Honor, this is Christopher Brooks, Tax Counsel for CDTFA. I'm going to object to the idea that uh, Opus provided some information that it only provides uh, sales based on Monday. I, we haven't seen anything of that sort. Uh, and I, I know that Mr. Shamu's referenced Exhibit G. I quickly flipped there. I don't, I don't think that applies to, uh, I haven't found anything that applies to Opus or Monday. So I'm going to object based on that. Um, if the court will allow um, me to supplement the exhibits that were admitted today at a subsequent time with information, all information I've received 
from Opus, um, if it would allow, I could resubmit any and all information that would corroborate the statements that I've made here today. This is Judge Wong. Uh, let's take a 10 minute break and then I will consult with my panel. Um, so let's take a 10 minute break. Please beat yourselves and turn off your camera and then we will reconvene at, let's see, it's 2.46 now, uh, about 2.56. Uh, okay. but, but don't leave though. Just uh, please mute. I'll just, I'm going to mute it and just so be here. Okay, thank you. All right, this is Judge Wong. Let us go back on the record. Uh, before the break, uh, there was a request to hold the record open to, to provide some additional material regarding uh, Opus uh, from Mr. Shamoon. CDTFA, do you have any objection to holding the record open to provide? That information. Uh, I was Hi, this is address this. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Christopher Brooks. Uh, uh, the department would object. We've had motions on that uh, earlier. In the last I guess, two years, uh, where we established that there was nothing that was going to be getting. I mean, that, that was only a request for the department to provide the witnesses, but there's uh, nothing. Uh, that we've seen where uh, the appellant needs additional time to provide information that it had with Opus. Uh, uh, we saw partial emails, uh, partial information. Uh, Opus is a business. They have a process that they use. You'd have to enter a contract. We haven't seen any of that information on what the exact language was between them, but that's been over two years. Uh, I don't, I don't see where we gain anything by holding open the, the record when we know that Opus isn't, go, unless they're going to enter into some new agreement. Uh, but I don't, I don't know when we gain anything by uh, waiting. What we've shown is that uh, the numbers that the department came up with based on the documents that appellant provided show what the markup should be, show that Opus and their records are virtually identical. Uh, I don't know what they're going to use to offset their own prices, their own purchase prices, that's going to change the outcome of this uh, assessment or this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. Mr. Shamoon, would you like to address CDTFA's objection? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Um, the, the, the pr Prior to me asking to, uh, to provide the information was the question by Judge Geary in regards to the Monday information. Um, I went and looked at Exhibit D. Um, it is explicit in Exhibit D, page 80 to 83, when the um, department set their OPUS guidelines for how they came up with the pricing. In their spreadsheet between pages 80 to 83, they list the OPUS pricing, and it's, it's every Monday. So the information is already, Your Honor, um, what you were looking for in regards to the Monday um, it's in Exhibit D, page 8083, when the department when, uh, calculated the average selling price, it inputted over uh, 400 entries, all of the Opus pricing, and it's, um, as you'll see by the dates, January 1, 8, 15, and the dates, it corresponds to the every Monday. So that is where that's already provided for in the information. Um, I don't know if I, at this point now, um, need to provide you with any supplement information since I found it in the um, um, exhibits that were that were submitted by the government for this hearing. Your Honor, if I can quickly respond to that. Uh, uh, I see both. Uh, sure, uh, this is Judge Wong. Okay, oh. go ahead, but please. Uh... If Mr. Schwanza wants to address it, I, either way. Okay, uh, Your Honor, the, uh, those pages that, uh, uh, Council is referring to are not applicable to Opus. Those are pages that are referenced as to the Department of Energy, and they provide an average, and it, the average is Monday to Monday. And so it's not just compiled on Monday. It has to go from someday to someday in the week, and they're saying that it ends, and you'll see that on, uh, I think it's pages like 182 or something like that. Uh, we just flipped it real quick. Uh, 
Yeah, I think it's uh, actually page 191 is the, the first page of, uh, of an additional exhibit showing the Department of Energy. And at the very top underneath the columns in, in bold, it says weekly Los Angeles regular all formulations. And below that, uh, it says ending date. And so it's just an average over a, over a week. It has nothing to do with Opus. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. But the Department of Energy uses the Opus pricing. I know it's which calculates it on that one uh, on every Monday. All the reports are on a Monday. The people that report, I mean, so then maybe I will stick. I, I do want to then continue um, uh, to provide documentation in regards to Opus because. I, um, the Opus prices are provided on a, uh, on a every Monday. People who report to Opus only are required to report uh, a one day a week. So the sales number are one day a week. I do believe it correlates to this, but if there's a dispute, I think it would be beneficial for all parties to, to know this information. It could be a short window of time um, and I could just supplement the file without any commentary. Um, but if it's relevant to making a determination here, and again, I don't want to dismiss my, my, our main purpose that we don't, you know, two arguments, one, whether we need Opus and then B, whether Opus is even accurate. My main strong argument is we've provided accurate records. There should be no adjustment. We don't need Opus, but if, if it's relevant to even the validity of Opus, which I do still, you know, um, we'll still focus on and make arguments for if it's going to make. Uh, if it's going to create more um, facts to make us make a more informed decision, um, I could provide to the court all methodology that I have. Uh, the, the burden should be on the state. If they're going to assess a taxpayer on a formula that is an outside third party, you would think that they would provide that information as to why it's relevant and why they should, and yet they haven't here. So I do believe that the burden is on the state. If they're gonna use this methodology, give us some reasons as to why and how, and give us an opportunity, our due process rights to cross-examine and to confront this, its accuracy and its validity. And we have not been afforded that opportunity. This is Judge Wong. Mr. Shamoon, how much time would you need to uh, supplement the record with uh, Opus-related uh, materials? Week, week, 10 days. I mean, we'll give you what we have. We'll look at the file. I mean, it's not been, you know, even a few days. I mean, it, not much time. I mean, okay. Um, I'm going to give, I'm going to hold the record open and allow uh, appellant to supplement it. And I'm also going to provide CDTFA with an opportunity to respond. Um, so you mentioned a week, uh, 15 days and 15 days. How, how, does 15 days be adequate? Um, Okay, and CDTFA is 15 days enough for you to respond once you receive uh, the supplemental submissions? This is Randy Squaw, so it's hard to say at this point. I mean, it seems fair. I guess we could ask for an extension, right? Um, if need be. You, you can. I would prefer. Okay, how about we do I mean, 30 and 30, just because there's a July 4th holiday coming up and whatnot, um, and just so we have set deadlines. Is 30 and 30 okay? Should be. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, let's just do that. And then we'll close the record after uh, that time period is is up. All right. So, and, and I'm sorry, if I can make one final comment too. Uh, again, I'm sorry. I, 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 um, just one final comment. I know there was a comment by the state in regards to uh, sales tax. Just for the record, um, sales tax is charged on the whole uh, on the wholesale purchase price, and then subsequently on sales, um, the sales tax is given. So, on the wholesale cost of the gas that was purchased, sales tax was paid on that cost. And so, um, if there was any self consumption, um, tax was already paid. However, in this circumstance. Um, even self consumption is rung up in the register, but not have to be paid. So, actually, the taxpayer in this circumstance overpaid because they weren't required to have to ring up 
the uh, gas that they use for self consumption, the tax was paid on the original wholesale price upon acceptance. Um, but also, it was actually uh, taken um, on the retail side for accounting records because it's run by employees. Him and a family member would grab gas, they ring it up, and then when they add the register, that missing cash is because the employee didn't have to pay for it. But the sale is recorded and income tax is even paid on it as well, income and sales tax. They are beyond honest in the way they operate uh, their business uh, more than I've ever seen. And so, uh, and, and their testimony is, is, is evidence. And, and I would love to give weight to the testimony of Alfred Atala today um, uh, in the accuracy of his records and record keeping. All right, thank you, Mr. Shamoon. All right, that will do it for today. As I mentioned, we're uh, holding the record open. I'll be issuing an order with uh, deadlines for additional submissions, first from appellant and then from CDTFA, after which the record will be closed. And then we will issue a decision no later than 100 days from that day. So be looking out for uh, that order, which I'll be issuing before the end of the week. Um, and I thank everyone for their time and presentations and look forward to the additional submissions. Uh, now the oral hearing is now adjourned and I thank everyone again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend and thank you and uh, have a wonderful day. And happy 4th everyone. Thank you. Happy 4th of July. Thank you very much. Have a great holiday. You too. you too, gentlemen.